Welcome to Spotlight on the Arts. I'll be your host today. My name is Michael McKeever. Joining us is our usual panel, the always wonderful actress, producer, and South Florida theater icon, Miss Iris Acker. Noted journalist and reviewer, the founder of Florida Theater on Stage, Mr. Bill Hirschman, and the always wonderful award-winning actress, Miss Karen Stevens. Today's topic is, did Shakespeare actually write Shakespeare? <laughs> and our very special guest today is Mr. Tom Renier, a writer and author of many books on the subject of Shakespeare and law. So Tom, welcome. Thank you for being here today. Thanks so much. Glad to be here. Well, let's get right to it. Did Shakespeare write Shakespeare? Well, Michael, for a long time, I was in love with this idea that this young man from Stratford who had very little education grew up to write these great plays, some of the greatest plays of all times. It's a beautiful story. But after looking into it very closely and studying the evidence for a number of years, I've come to the conclusion that there's room for reasonable doubt about that story. And I'll tell you why. Uh, let, let me tell you a little about my background. I'm a lawyer. And uh, I've taught as an adjunct professor at various law schools. And one of the courses I've taught is called Shakespeare and the Law, which I taught at the University of Miami School of Law. And um, we spent a whole semester studying Shakespeare's plays and finding legal references, legal allusions, legal plot twists in Shakespeare's plays. And there have been about 50 books written about Shakespeare's knowledge of the law and hundreds of articles. And uh, Shakespeare really understood the law from a technical standpoint. He understood the big picture. He understood the technical details. And he knew legal reasoning. And that's not something that you just pick up from casual conversation with lawyers. It's something that takes formal training. And I don't think that you could write a book on Christopher Marlowe's knowledge of the law or Ben Jonson's knowledge of the law or any other Elizabethan playwright. Shakespeare is unique in this respect. And his knowledge of the law is just the beginning of his knowledge. Doctors have written books about his knowledge of medicine. And recently, I attended a Shakespeare conference where a neurologist talked about Shakespeare's knowledge of neurology. That's how precise his knowledge is. And then you've got to look at all these other areas where Shakespeare shows his expertise in his works. He's very knowledgeable about precious, precious stones, about Italy, about uh, aristocratic sports like falconry, about uh, navigation and gardening, and it, the list goes on and on. There are probably about 20 or 25 subjects where people have written books about Shakespeare's knowledge of that subject. Okay, so you're kind of blowing my mind here. So yes. what you're saying is it's impossible for one person to be so knowledgeable about so many different topics? I'm not saying it's impossible for one person to know so much about so many different things, but I'm saying it's very unlikely that the man from Stratford that people usually say is the author uh, could have known all these things. And let me just tell you a little bit about the man's life, what we know about it. There are about 70 documents in existence about the Stratford man's life. Um, we don't know that he ever went to school, that he ever wrote a letter, or that he ever owned a book. Uh, so that makes it kind of questionable about, questionable about whether he actually could have written these plays. And if you look at his signatures, now there are six accepted signatures uh, of the man from Stratford. The, the signatures all look different from each other. The custodian of public records in London in 1985 said that these look like they're the signatures of different men. There's no way of telling which one is the real thing. Uh, so the question is, could he actually write his own name, or were these written for him by law clerks? Well, but when you say that he knows a lot about about various types of science and the law and various other things. I'm an old investigative reporter mm -hmm. and I would, when I worked on a story, do intensive research and interview people who were experts on it so that I could in fact write intelligently about school construction, for instance, which I knew nothing about. Could he not have done something similar? Um, well, first of all, there's questionable about whether he was literate at all, whether he could read and write at all. Uh -huh. uh, and, and that's you know, based on the signatures and based on the fact that there's nothing uh, in his handwriting other than possibly these signatures. Um, also, if somehow uh, the man from Stratford uh, gained all this knowledge, maybe somehow it had access to books or access to education, he got it without leaving a trace as to how he did it. That and was that, why, that's what I was going to ask. I, I, we know how we, we don't, we know. We are told what he was like when he was writing. What was he like right before? 
I mean, what's his background as a child? Where did he grow up? Uh, and did he go to school? Well, the question about the school is we don't actually know if he went to school. They didn't keep records of students' names in those days, but it's odd that there's no extrinsic evidence. Well, I was going to say, do we know if anyone went to school? <laughs> like, you know, I mean, it's not just him. It's like, that, like I said, there weren't records well, there kept. Well, there schools. So, I mean, <laughs> yes. we know if they went to university, but, you know, as far as formal education. Where did the doubt about his authenticity begin? Well, I think that during his lifetime, nobody ever connected him with the plays that were being written under the name William Shakespeare. There's no evidence that anybody ever thought that this man from Stratford was a playwright or a poet. And uh, most people probably assumed that the name William Shakespeare that they saw on the plays was a pseudonym. The Elizabethan age was the golden age of pseudonyms. <laughs> most writers used a pseudonym at one time or another. And the name William Shakespeare is a perfect name for somebody to use if he's going to be a writer of poetry and drama. Because Shakespeare refers to the goddess Athena, the spear shaker, who, as you will recall from the story, uh, was born when she sprang fully armored from the brow of her father Zeus and was shaking a spear. And she's the goddess of the arts and philosophy and wisdom. And also, the word William in the uh, Old Dutch is Gildhelm, which means golden helmet. And uh, the goddess Athena is often seen wearing a golden helmet. So for somebody who's very literate and knows about these things and wants to make up a pseudonym for himself as a writer, William Shakespeare would be an excellent pseudonym. And the man from Stratford, by the way, didn't spell his name Shakespeare. He spelled it Shakespeare. Yeah, I was going to say, I see it spelled different ways. Yes. Yes, now, they were, in, in the Elizabethan days, they were very much looser about spelling than we are. But usually, a person would find a consistent way of spelling his own name. And if this man was writing plays under the name William Shakespeare, why wouldn't he change his own personal name to that same spelling? So it's very <laughs> odd that he never did. He was born Shakespeare. He died Shakespeare. Um, well, well, then so, this, but this begs the question, then, who wrote this work? I mean, it's some of the, the best work ever written yes. for the stage. Who wrote it? Glad you asked. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so several people have been mentioned as candidates. And um, there have been many candidates. And I think it's because most of the people that have been mentioned are much more likely to have written the plays than the man from Stratford. Hmm. Uh, but after studying this quite a bit and looking at the different candidates, I think it's most likely that the plays were written by Edward de Vere who was the 17th Earl of Oxford. And there's quite a bit of circumstantial yeah. evidence in his favor. If you'd like me to go Absolutely. into it. Absolutely, yeah. please, give us, give us some, <laughs> some yeah, examples. Please. Well, uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, so we, we, know, we know quite a lot about de Vere. Um, and we know that there were books written during his life that described him as a secret author who could not allow his work to be published under his own name. Why? Yeah, was, well, first of all. They have a blacklist back there, too. <laughs> <laughs> Not exactly. It was more like a golden list or something. Was, if you were a nobleman, it was considered beneath you to write plays or poetry. Uh, you could write a, a serious work, like a religious treatise or a scientific treatise or something like that. But poetry was considered frivolous. And plays, forget it. That was even worse. That was, that was scandalous. <laughs> Noblemen did not write plays under their own name. But we know that Edward de Vere loved the theater. He loved poetry. We do have some of his youthful poems which show some of the seeds of what we see in Shakespeare's sonnets later on. Um, but um, de Vere was a patron of the arts. Uh, there were more books dedicated to him during his life than anybody else in the Elizabethan age except Queen Elizabeth. Uh, we know that he had two theater troops, a boys' troop and a men's troop. He uh, leased the Blackfriars Theater in the 1580s for his boys' troop. Um, we know that uh, one of the great influences in Shakespeare's writing is Ovid's Metamorphoses. Well, Ovid's Metamorphoses was translated into English by Arthur Golding, who was Edward de Vere's uncle. And in fact, they were living in the same household at the time that Golding was working on the translation. Interesting. Michael, as a playwright, have you not been taught, going way back, write about something you know? Oh, absolutely. And Shakespeare is way the other end. I mean, where did he get these, if, if he, in fact, he wrote it, where did the characters come from? 
His life? Hardly. Well, he borrowed well, Maybe a lot I shouldn't of them. say that. Maybe it did. Maybe that's the kind of he life. Borrowed, did he not borrow characters and plots and germs of ideas from earlier, which Neil Simon did and a lot of other exactly. people did? But exactly. Exactly, yes. Yes. Well, okay, yes, in Shakespeare's plays, he used a lot of different sources, and a lot of them are based on. Uh, stories that somebody else had written, but usually if you read those source stories, you will find that the characters are very shallow, they have uh, all the subtlety of uh, characters in a fairy tale, a uh, child's fairy tale. So um, what Shakespeare does, whoever Shakespeare was, is adds enormous detail about these people. And let me give you uh, some good examples here. I think Hamlet is probably the play that most parallels Edward de Vere's life. And let me just start with the fact that uh, Polonius in Hamlet has long been considered a parody of Sir William Cecil, Lord Burley, uh, who was Queen Elizabeth's right-hand man, probably the most powerful man in England at the time, had his own spy network. And you recall in Hamlet, Polonius uh, sends one of his servants to spy on Polonius' son while he's away at university. Uh, so that's a, l a little tidbit uh, connecting him to uh, Lord Burley. Well, um, so did Oxford know Lord Burley? Well, when Oxford was 12, his father died. He became a ward of the queen. He was sent to live in Lord Burley's household. He later married Lord Burley's daughter, and Cecil, so Lord Burley was his father-in-law. So yes, he knew him very well, and they had a long and not always easy relationship because they were extremely different personalities. Uh, Edward de Vere loved the arts. Uh, Lord Burley didn't particularly care for the arts. He was much more serious and, and didn't like to get involved in these frivolous things. So yes, that's the beginning right there. And then you see a lot of Edward de Vere's uh, relationship with his wife, Anne Cecil, uh, in the relationship between Hamlet and Ophelia. Well, what, what's the possibility, you know, that there's a fourth or fifth answer, for instance, that there are two or three different people who could have written these plays, in other words, are there stylistic differences, uh, uh, vocabulary differences, that would indicate that this, these plays seem to have been written by somebody with a different writing style? Or could it just be the same person whose style has evolved over time? Um, I think that the bulk of what we know as the works of Shakespeare was all written by one person. Yeah. And I think that that person is Edward de Vere. I think almost anybody would admit that there are signs that some people may have edited later on or added a scene here and there, something like that. But I think that, that mostly what we have is one person's work. So if, he if William Shakespeare was a real person... And he was, yes. How can William Shakespeare be a pseudonym? Well... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> if someone else is writing the plays... Right. Well, is, I, that, I, is that a valid question? Well, well, yes. But I mean, I, you know, I could I could choose a pseudonym, and it happens to be the same name as, as some real person that exists. Uh, okay. It doesn't mean that that person actually is is writing. Uh, what you're what saying is that is. that particular William Shakespeare just lucked he out. He just lucked out. <laughs> yes. yes it, okay. I, I, yeah. I don't know. You, you've probably known people in your life who had the same first and last name as a famous person. I went I went to school with a kid named James Madison. You know, and but, but the I William, knew he wasn't president of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> but was there not a William Shakespeare who was an actor manager? And was that the man from Stratford? Yes. That's, and if it was, wouldn't it then be logical that he would also be a playwright? That's a good point, yes. Yes, the man from Stratford uh, was a theater uh, shareholder. Mm -hmm. And we have two records of his having acted. Uh, so there is some connection to the theater. And in his will, he left some money for rings to three of the actors uh, in the company. So yes, we, we think there was a connection to a theater. And, and we think that the similarity of the name and also the fact uh, that he had this uh, connection are some of the reasons that after his death, uh, people wanted to make it out as if he was the actual author of these plays. Now, during the 1590s and early 1600s when plays were being published and, and uh, performed under the name William Shakespeare, uh, there's no evidence anybody thought of the Stratford man as the author. And even as early as about 1595, you'll find writers like Joseph Hall and John Marston speculating in print about who actually wrote Venus and Adonis, which was the first work published under the name William Shakespeare. And they never, it never crossed their minds that the man from Stratford could have written the plays. They assumed that it was a pseudonym, and I think that most people did at that time. Really? I, the, I, reading Shakespeare, knowing Shakespeare, seeing, I mean, people don't talk like that. So right away, it's a technique 
that he's using. He's, it's, it's poetry. Yes. Everything of his is poetry, except for a poem, perhaps. You know, but this is like a long poem, all his plays. Yes. And Shakespeare had a huge vocabulary. Shakespeare introduced many, many words into the English language. Mm -hmm. And part of this comes from the fact that whoever wrote these words was very familiar with Greek and Latin and other languages because a lot of these words are based on other languages. And we know Edward de Vere, the Earl of Oxford, was fluent in uh, Greek, uh, Italian, French, um, Latin, as well as English, of course, and, uh, and may have known a bit of some other languages as well. So this is somebody who is very much qualified by education and so forth to have, uh, have written these plays and to have the education that is necessary uh, to have written the plays. Now, one of the things I was talking about Hamlet a little earlier, I just want to mention one other thing, one other thing and this could be a coincidence, but I think it's kind of interesting. Uh, you may recall that in Hamlet, at one point he writes a letter to Claudius and he says that he was captured by pirates and they left him naked on the shore of Denmark. Well, Edward de Vere, after he had visited Europe, was crossing the English Channel and he was captured by pirates who left him naked on the shore of England. <laughs> uh, just a, another little But doesn't tidbit. that really happen to everyone now and then? Oh, <laughs> well, of course, you yes. Know, it's, it's just... It, <laughs> let's, let's talk about Marlowe. I've heard Marlowe's yeah, name tossed in right. time and again about yeah. the whole, about him writing the work of Shakespeare. How does he figure into all of this? Well, I think the Marlowe theory is an interesting one, and, and whether it's true or not, I think it would make a great movie. <laughs> and, uh, okay. and so the, the idea is that, uh, of course, Marlowe died, I think, in 1593, uh, and that's, of course, before anything was published under the name William Shakespeare. So the theory is, and there's a book by Calvin Hoffman on this that's, that's rather interesting. It's fun to read, whether you believe it or not. Uh, but the theory is that he actually faked his own death <laughs> and that they substituted the body of someone else, perhaps a dead sailor that they found, and that's the body that was presented as the body of Christopher Marlowe. And then Marlowe was spirited off, perhaps, to Italy, where uh, he continued writing plays, only he used the pen name William Shakespeare. <laughs> what would be the point of that? What, what would be the reason to do such uh, yes. a thing? Well, uh, yes, actually recent research has shown that um, uh, Marlowe was doing some spying uh, for the Privy Council and that apparently uh, he was getting in trouble and he was also uh, being accused of atheism, which was a, a big crime in those days. And so uh, apparently he felt his life was in danger and that's why all of this was done. So it, it's an interesting story. I mean, it, it it's, makes a great plot, like I said, but uh, <laughs> I, I don't know that it's actually true. Uh, and I think there, there are some stylistic similarities between Marlowe and the works of Shakespeare, but a lot of times when you see similarities, it's hard to tell, was this were these things written by the same person or is this just one person influencing another person? So those are tricky kinds of questions that we really have to sort out. So, uh, you know, I wouldn't put the Marlowe theory out of hand. Uh, I wouldn't reject it out of hand, but um, I think that there's so much more evidence uh, that points to Edward de Vere, the Earl of Oxford, that I think I really have to go with that theory as being much stronger than the Marlowe theory. Are there any other names that have been tossed into the hat? Uh, well, Sir Francis Bacon comes up. Uh, yeah. uh, William Stanley, who was the Earl of Derby and was Oxford's uh, son-in-law, comes up as a name. Uh, the Countess of Pembroke comes up from time to time. Even Queen Elizabeth has been mentioned uh, as uh, the possible author. I mean, certainly she had the education to do it. I don't know if she would have had the time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and this but, book, Shakespeare Beyond Doubt, question mark. Okay. Uh, I have read chapters of that, and each, you're in that book. Yes, I wrote a chapter in it, yes. And your chapter was, your, your response to that was, in your chapter, you're a believer. I'm a believer that Shakespeare did not write Shakespeare. <laughs> let, let, yeah, let me explain something about this book and how it came about. Uh, in 2013, uh, what I'll call the Shakespeare <laughs> Establishment, put out a book called Shakespeare Beyond Doubt. And their idea was to prove that there's no doubt about the man from Stratford uh, writing the plays. And they didn't even say beyond reasonable doubt. They just said Shakespeare beyond doubt. <laughs> a reasonable doubt, a lawyer talking. Yes. So uh, 
Right, so uh, a, a number of people who disagreed with that, myself being one of them, uh, put together this book in response, which came out about six weeks later. And wow. uh, this is called Shakespeare Beyond Doubt with a question mark after it. <laughs> and uh, so I actually encourage people to read both books uh, because I think that you'll see in their book, all they do really is um, appeal to authority. They say, well, the experts say this, the experts say this, and you have to agree with the experts. And they do a lot of name calling of people that don't agree with them. Uh, and, and otherwise, they don't really look at the evidence very much. Uh, and actually, Prince Philip read their book, and he became a doubter from reading from their reading book, their which book. said Beyond Doubt. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, yeah, if you, if you look up Shakespeare Beyond Doubt on Amazon, for example, you'll find both of these books coming up. And uh, so, by the way, I brought copies of this for everybody. I'm so nice. Nice. And, uh, nice. Yes. Could Go ahead, Esther. Yeah, no, first, I was going to ask you about the commercialization of Shakespeare. Who profits from that? If you go to, to, uh, to his home, suppose that was his home, was it really his home In Stratford. that all the tourists go to? <laughs> Anne Hathaway's. Iris, I, you know, I've been there a couple of times myself. And the first time Have I went, you? I was about 17. And um, I've come to learn a lot of things about it. First of all, they say that this is the house where he was born. This was Anne Hathaway's house. This was uh, yep. the house where his son-in-law, John Hall, lived with his daughter, Susanna. Uh, and that's all made up. They don't know which house is which. I believed. And, and I know. And, and I'll tell you, of, of all the groups and organizations that has a vested interest in the traditional story, it's the Shakespeare Birthplace Trust, which runs this theme park in Stratford-upon-Avon, which is a big tourist attraction, brings in a lot yes. of money. And uh, so, yes, the, the houses, too, were probably rebuilt in the 19th century as well. Maybe, maybe something like they were before. But yet most of the things they say, it's just all speculation. So they everything that has his photo on it, photo uh, of him, cups, and it, you know, all these things you can buy, including myself, I have several. <laughs> Who profits from it? You say there's a trust? Yes, and of course the town of Stratford profits from it, from all the tourists that come in. Stratford yeah, itself. Yes, yeah, Stratford itself. And also, now there are a lot of academics, Shakespeare scholars, who have built their reputation around writing biographies of William Shakespeare. Ah, and they write book-length biographies, and I'll tell you, all the known facts about his life you can put in a couple of pages. <laughs> so they have to stretch it out a lot. They talk a lot about the history of the town of Stratford. They talk about the history of theater during those times and so forth. And, and they try to fit the but Stratford But there's man's no life. documented proof at all that shows that Stratford's Shakespeare was a writer at all. No, contemporary, no contemporaneous Amazing. evidence, nothing during his lifetime. The first thing that suggests that he was a writer is the first folio, which comes out seven years uh, after his death. So the publishers benefited from it. Somebody. Publishers, yes. Now maybe, perhaps, maybe the, the Shakespeare scholars will realize that if they suddenly start saying uh, that Edward de Vere was the author of the plays, now they'll have to rewrite all those books and make new editions and make more money on there them. There was a movie though <laughs> recently about de Vere writing the plays, Anonymous, correct? yes. Right, Anonymous. It was called Anonymous right. and uh, it was uh, directed by Roland Emmerich and it's a great flick. I mean, I, I really enjoyed it. It's, it's got a lot of historical inaccuracies in it, but so, so <laughs> did Shakespeare's play. <laughs> so, uh, you know. Uh, Knowing but, the truth sometimes spoils the story. <laughs> oh, as a writer, I've always said that. Never let the truth get in the way of telling the story. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> So, I, I, uh, I, I'm not that this means anything, but I, I had not heard of the Edward de Vere uh, possibility. Mm -hmm. um, of course, I've heard of Christopher Marlowe and a couple of others, mm -hmm. but is it possible that he could have been um, a member of a, a collective, a righteous collective, it's, and that they all wrote together? Well, uh, I think there's some possibility that, that he collaborated with other people a little bit. We know that a couple of Oxford's secretaries uh, John Lilly and Anthony Mundy were playwrights themselves. <coughs> and uh, you can imagine he's sitting around working on a scene and they suggest a line or something like that or an idea, a plot twist or something like that. Or who knows exactly. <laughs> so I, I think something like that could have happened. We, we don't really know. But I think that uh, still De Vere was probably mm. the main writer. Wow. Interesting. Interesting. I, I, I just, I, you know, I, I think it's really funny that this man has become an icon yes. of, of <laughs> theater, uh, and 
he may not even exist. <laughs> well, he did exist. Well, I mean, the, the Shakespeare that we've yeah, well, created. Shakespeare. Yes. As, as an actor, as an actor, have you ever attempted Shakespeare? Yes, I've been in uh, Shakespeare you in did. production. Yeah. Michael? Not for 30 years, I've no. I've actually yeah, been well, in seven well, I, Shakespeare ever, productions. I so. find that uh, the speech, the pattern and everything, it's, it's, it, you have to, t I have to take a class. Yeah, yeah there's to a learn definite learn rhythm to the, yeah. to how the to, language. Yes, yes. Yeah. So it takes some study to learn yes. how to speak it. Yes. And uh, memorizing it I found very difficult. But I think those who do it and do it and do it and do it, it's a, you know, a way I think of, that's one of the problems in South Florida. There are exceptions, but there are very few people in South Florida's acting community who have either A, the training, or even better, even if they have the training, the opportunities to learn by doing. Yeah, it, it, opportunity. It, yeah. Definitely. It, it's funny, I have, a, um, I have the pleasure of working with um, uh, a young actor just recently who graduated from Yale and he's worked on a lot of Shakespeare and it was fascinating to watch him actually literally line by line translate um, the text of Shakespeare. It was yeah. really interesting. It really huh. was interesting. It, it's just fascinating to me that like I said, there's question about the, the authorship of this amazing, amazing work. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm, I'm, I knew this was going to be a terrific show, yeah. and, <laughs> and thank you for, um, for bearing that out. Thanks. Well, it's really the best who done it in the world, as uh, <laughs> Sir Derek Jacobi said, who's uh, uh, also a, a doubter about the traditional theories. I've got to love it. Tom, yes. thank you so much for being here. Oh, thank um, you. My pleasure. Uh, this great panel that I always have the pleasure to uh, share this show with. Thank you all, and thank you for being here with us. I hope you had a good time. We certainly did. Did he or didn't he? You figure it out. Google did Shakespeare write Shakespeare and find out. Thank you so much for joining us. It's been a blast. We'll see you next time. If you want to find out anything about South Florida Theater, just go to floridatheateronstage.com. This is Michael McKeever for Spotlight on the Arts. We'll see you next time.